everyone, and welcome to the Course of World History. I am your host, Mr. Samuelson, and today we are looking at the Tokugawa period in Japan, also referred to as the Edo period at times. Our essential question for the day is, what was life like in Tokugawa, Japan? Well, it emerges out of a period of chaos. In the late 1400s, central power in Japan had collapsed. And the island had broken into factions um, led by these lords referred to as the daimyo. Um, these were noble families that had controlled areas under the central government, but now were acting like their own independent feudal territories and warring nearly constantly with each other for control over land and resources. This was not a very good um, period for Japanese history. But they will unify out of this period and is largely due to the efforts of three individuals. Um, it takes them about 20 years for this unification process to happen, begins in 1582 and goes until 1603. So this is coming off of 100 years of disunity. The first one, and I'm going to butcher some names today, I'm sorry about that. Uh, the first of these leaders was Oda Nabunaga. Um, he is going to capture Kyoto, which was uh, the Japanese capital at that time. And using that as his base, he's going to unify central Japan. And now he had goals of pushing his unification and his control a little bit further than just central Japan, uh, but he was killed. He was killed by one of his subordinate military leaders. Now, again, apologize for the names. Uh, Toyotomi uh, Hideyoshi um, is going to be the guy who takes control. That's this guy right here. Um, after the fall of the previous gentleman, whose name I'm not going to try again, uh, he takes control and convinces many of the daimyo uh, to accept his rule. But the daimyo did remain powerful and in many ways semi-autonomous. He did not have complete control. It was more like a broad alliance with a number of still semi-independent military leaders. It's going to take the final individual, Tokugawa Aishu, um, who is going to finally unify China. He is one of the powerful daimyo um, and is going to take control of Japan after Hideyoshi's death in 1598. Now, Aishu, or Tokugawa, um, takes this title shogun um, after he seizes control. Now, the shogun was a title for the supreme military leader of all of, uh, all of Japan. And when he takes that title, he is projecting to Japan that he is the boss. He is in charge. He is going to be the military leader of everyone. And he uses this military power to restore central authority um, and central unification of Japan. Now, the Tokugawa shoguns, um, his family kind of maintains that shogunate, that, that central power. Technically, there's an emperor above them, but in Japanese society, the emperor has more of a pseudo-religious ceremonial role. It's really the shoguns who are the supreme power. Um, they are going to rule Japan from their capital of Edo, all the way until 1868. This is another reason why this is called the Edo period, as Edo it becomes the capital of Japan. Now, Europeans are poking their nose into Japan uh, during this Tokugawa period. Uh, first Europeans had really showed up 1543, so even before the unification had happened. And they were welcomed. They came with novel new inventions, uh, clocks, guns, different things that the Japanese weren't producing yet and kind of opened Japan to a little bit more of the global trade, trade network. Remember, Japan sits right next to China and China's become very isolationist during this time. So there's not a whole lot of trade going on until the Europeans show up and introduce more trade items. But the Europeans also brought something that started to rub the Japanese the wrong way, and that is missionaries. Missionaries, particularly Jesuit missionaries who came and were fairly aggressive in pushing Christianity and conversion to Christianity. So much so that these um, Jesuit missionaries would burn uh, Japanese Shinto, their religion, shrines um, to signal a break from the old religion and the introduction of the new religion. 
course, a lot of people who still practice the Shinto faith had a major problem with their shrines being burned by these foreign religious people who had arrived in Japan. And it caused enough friction and enough distaste for Europeans as a whole that uh, Japan grew to dislike European influence on the islands and banned further European trade with Japan. So they take kind of the Chinese isolationist path here and keep the Europeans out. Other aspects of the Tokugawa rule, uh, during the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, Japan modernized in some important ways. The upper class in Japan um, begins to increasingly invest in and participate in trade and industry. Um, this is more internal trade, uh, but they're building more things, they're selling more things to more parts of Japan. Remember, Japan was fractured, and during the, the kind of feudal wars that they were having, trade would have been really difficult between different areas. Now Japan is unified again. They use that unification to build a lot of internal trade routes. Um, during this time, cities like Kyoto and Edo and Osaka, um, in particular, begin to grow and flourish. Uh, Nagasaki as well, to a slightly lesser degree. Edo, by the way, is modern Tokyo today. Um, so those cities are growing in importance. Other economic changes are happening. Um, by 1750, Edo had a population of over 1 million, making it one of the largest cities in the world. Uh, banking had become a major business, uh, and bankers and merchants were becoming very wealthy, despite, and we'll get into this in a moment, their relatively low social status, uh, but they are becoming very wealthy. Taxes, however, were falling mostly on the peasant farmers. Most of the taxes were land-based and hit the peasant farmers really hard, so much so that they had trouble paying for these taxes. So increasingly, their land was being bought up by larger, wealthier, larger landholders, um, and that would dispossess the Chinese, uh, the Japanese people, leaving them without resources of their own and forcing them to be employed by others. This does not sit well with anybody, not then and not now. And um, during this Tokugawa period, there are actually almost 7,000 peasant revolts and protests against the tax rates. It becomes a major problem within Japan. So the social hierarchy. Uh, social class during Tokugawa period became more rigid, became virtually impossible to move between these classes. Uh, people were divided into warrior, farmer, artisan, and merchant classes and could not change that position. Think about what we learned within the Hindu caste system, and we have an idea about uh, what is going on in this system. Um, Japanese were also not allowed to marry anybody outside of their social class. So if you were a peasant, you had to marry a peasant and so on. In this feudal-like system, remember our feudal pyramid, and you'll see a lot of similarities here. Um, in this feudal-like system, military leaders were at the top and merchants, as referenced earlier, actually had the very bottom position. So they are wealthy and yet they have a lot of... Um, social stigma against that position. They're, they're not seen as producers of anything of value. All right, so the warrior class. The warrior class was the top. And the warrior class in Japan included the shogun, who was all the way up at the top, who oversaw the daimyo, who were like the lords in this society. Below the daimyo are the samurai, so think like knights or minor landed uh, lords, um, who were trained warriors and um, frequently were landholders and had territory of their own. Below the samurai were the ronin. Ronin were professional warriors who were trained to fight and could charge a decent amount for their service, but they did not have land of their own, and they were not permanently tied to a daimyo as a master. So they would travel the land seeking employment um, by the different daimyo or the shogun himself. The role of women in a Japanese society, women had very few rights, um, much more limited rights than we've seen in most of the other societies that we have studied in this class. Uh, and these rights were even smaller in the higher social classes. Males were always the head of the family and they had complete authority over property, marriage, and divorce. Uh, women had no say in any of those areas. Um, women had no say in who they married, 
And if a divorce were to happen, it would only be at the direction of the husband who could divorce for nearly any reason. Women instead were expected to raise children, keep the household clean, prepare meals in lower classes, and that was really their limited role in this um, very male-dominated feudal society. All right, literature and the arts. During the Tokugawa shogunate, literature was widely available for the first time. We first see uh, literacy dramatically increasing. Uh, love stories and poems about nature um, were the most popular. The Shinto faith is a very na naturalistic faith, so the poems about nature tied into the religious beliefs of the Japanese people. Kabuki theater uh, <laughs> emphasized action and dramatic gestures. Um, these are very colorful, dramatic, loud plays um, that were produced and very popular throughout Japan. Although following with their beliefs about women in society, women actors were forbidden during this period of Japanese theater. Okay, that is what we have on the Japanese Tokugawa shogunate. Um, we will be picking up more with Japan as they have a very important role in 20th century uh, world history. But that is all for today. I hope you enjoyed yourselves and learned a thing or two. I'll see you next time. Farewell.